We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. Looks like the rain has gone. G'day and welcome back to the Mankind Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Clift. And in this episode, we're going to be with author, leader, and all-round legendary bloke, Charles Matthews, to talk about leadership, manhood, and everything in between. More specifically, this episode is going to be understanding what is needed in a leader. What qualities, what characteristics, what, oh, what kind of resume does a leader need to bring to the table? to be able to effectively lead in a world that seems to be rapidly changing at a pace that many of us can't (laughs) can't even understand or keep up with. I mean, consider this. Something that only five years ago was considered okay to say, do, now today is considered horrible, toxic, uh, something that you could get fired over. Now, this in no way... Just, I want you to know this. This conversation is no, in no way trying to validate poor behavior. What we are setting out to do in this conversation is bring awareness as to why so many in leadership are getting the boot or are willingly stepping down. And also why many aren't wanting to step into positions of leadership. Because it seems that the environment And the arena for leaders these days has never been more, I guess you could say, trickier to navigate, which is exactly why I wanted to bring on Charles Matthews, the author of Leadership and Masculinity, Embracing New Strength, to come on and discuss with us, really, what is needed in a leader today? What qualities and characteristics can they bring to the table to be able to engage and effectively lead in today's leadership arena? And I also wanted to bring on my co-host, Boyson Hodgson, because I consider him a fantastic leader. He's a close friend with Charles and brings himself, I believe, a great lens and awareness to what we're going to be talking about uh, as it pertains to men, masculinity, leadership, and what it is that we need today to help us in our communities, in our organizations, uh, in our households to be able to move forward effectively and be a part of the change that we want to see. You're going to love this episode with Charles Matthews, Boyson Hodgson, and myself. Enjoy. G'day, and welcome to another live recording of the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove there's more than one way to be a man. I am your host, Brandon Clifton. I am joined today by my co-host, Boyson Hodgson. Mate, welcome to the show. And we are also joined by Charles Matthews. Matthews. Oh, Matthews. My goodness. Matthews, there you go. Yeah. Sorry, it's the, the Greek in the name. <laughs> uh, Ma- Charles Matthews is a leadership consultant and soul work mentor with a focus on helping male leaders find and deploy new strength. He's also the co-host of the Remaking Manhood podcast alongside Mark Green, who is a fan favorite with uh, the contributions he's made to this show. And he is also a budding author. He's got a new book out there, Leadership and Masculinity, Embracing Yay. New Strength, Lead Well, Live Fully, and Leave a Legacy. And mate, this book has really hit the ground running. What, number one USA new release and under human resources. Number one USA hot new release under men's health, which is an incredibly uh, growing category nowadays. Yeah. Three in Canada for men's health. One hot new release in Canada, Australia hot new release. I don't know. We like to read books down there. Ha, just a little, little penal colony joke about Australia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this is, uh, this is a joy. I've been wanting to have this conversation with, with you all for a long time. This is great. Mm fantastic mate it's it's a it's a pleasure when i shared with boyson that you'd reached out and we'd connected and just beaming ear to ear he got excited knowing that and of course he's like can i please be on that one can i come (laughs) yeah Uh, let's let's yeah let's play let's have some fun wonderful so first things first let's start off nice and light down with the patriarchy no (laughs) yeah no 
we are at an interesting kind of place in time and history, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, of course, said down with the patriarchy and kind of a, you know, a, a, trying to bring some levity in a sense to this conversation, because of course, there are so, there is so much debate, there is so much conversation, there is so much uh, separation between this idea of leadership as it's always been and then leadership mm -hmm. today what is expected what is wanted what is required i mean we're seeing not only a mass exodus in workers and employees but we're also seeing a lot of leaders step down that it's just not not worth it anymore right it's just too right. much struggle too much confusion too much uh impact on mental health so mate i want to ask you first and foremost what was the calling to write this book yeah yeah well i think it you identified it the there's this gap right between what the 21st century is calling for you know i say it's an all hands on deck moment right there's like there are there are wildfires outside of london right now London is not supposed to, we, we you know, used to caught fire back in the 17th century and all, but it's not supposed to do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, 91 degrees here in upstate New York. It's not supposed to be 91 degrees in upstate New York. And of course, you know, in your home country, Brandon, the, the floods fired, followed by fire, followed by floods again, you know, that's not supposed to be happening. So that's just on the climate, right? We got this COVID uh, uh, pandemic that, that has been mishandled. Uh, and we've got male leaders who are engaged in bullying and harassment on a systemic level who are making it impossible for women, people of color, LGBTQI people, uh, and even just other men to really bring their best to work, to being able to serve, to be of purpose, to solve problems. Uh, and we know that inclusive organizations are eight times more likely to meet their, their business goals. Uh, we know that fathers who are able to be uh, more inclusive of their own emotions, their children have better outcomes. They are healthier. They are less likely to be sexist. They are less likely to engage in bullying. They are uh, going to be more successful at school. We know that teachers who are more inclusive and uh, uh, are able to adopt people skills and, and relational skills as well as their content skills create better outcomes. They are 11% uh, higher test scores uh, if the teachers are able to bring this kind of uh, new leadership into play. So we know what works, and yet many men in particular are either stuck in the old mode, continue to be bullying, continue to be top-down power over leaders, or as you say, they check out of leadership. They don't start the business that they want to start, or they don't grow their business because they don't feel confident enough in their relational and leadership skills to hire employees. So they hold their light, you know, the thing that they have to give their beautiful business idea is held back because they don't want to grow the business. Um, so, you know, are men, should men step aside? Should men, you know, abdicate or, you know, can they be included in actually creating positive change in the 21st century? And I'm, you know, my, my book is, it's a deeply naive, Pollyanna optimistic book, my answer is yes, men are, we need men to step up and men can step up. You know, we've been told a bunch of stuff about how to behave. We've been shoved into the man box uh, around our expression of masculinity, but we don't have to stay there. We can step out of the man box with some help and, and make a big difference for ourselves, for others and for the planet. Uh, see, that's, that's, see, that's my hope because I get the great fortune of um, getting to be living here in the South, right? The Southeast of the United States. And it's been such an incredible experience for me having been exposed to, let's just say a stronger political leaning to, to one direction and to help me unpack my binary thinking and thought processes and to meet uh, perhaps men that you would say fall into, you know, this old mold or this old style of leadership yet they have phenomenal uh, willingness to, to look at different ways to go about their approach. Like I would judge that more people are willing, at least, they may not be wanting, but willing to look at you know, their leadership in a new way, how they turn up in the workforce and how it pertains to their masculinity as well. So with that in mind, though, the frustrations that I'm hearing from a lot of these men 
is that there isn't so much like of a welcoming experience to say, hey, here's a new way to look at things. And, and you know, here's a, here's a slower approach that we can take to looking at that. It's how all of a sudden rug pulled out. How dare you behave in that way? How dare you think that way? How dare you look at this situation or the scenario in this fashion? You know, that, that is exactly what has gotten us to this point. That is the problem. And it, so it isn't this, hey, here's some new ideas. Come along. We welcome you. We invite you into the conversation. It's this, no, you're the enemy all of a sudden, right? You don't fit the new hip, cool way to be, you know, inclusive or to be self-aware. And that really saddens me that there isn't even this welcoming into the space. Yeah. 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 And, you know, we were talking before we got, uh, before we started recording and, and I was just checking in about the fact that I'd moved, I'd, I'd uprooted myself. So this was by choice. So it's a little bit different. Um, but I uprooted myself from the desert Southwest and now I'm in, in upstate New York and I was, you know, just expressing some real sadness and anxiety that I don't, I can't tell which literally which direction I'm facing when I'm here. I can't tell which way is north. And I explained that in my career as an outdoor guide and, and leader and facilitator, I always knew what the right direction was. You know, I could, I knew, I could see on the horizon, the mountains, or I could see, you know, okay, this is the shore, that's the ocean. So that must be west, you know, whatever it was. And, and so I'm thrown for a loop right now. And I feel uh, anxious that I don't know the right direction. So what, you know, there's a great metaphor for how we as men have been uprooted from, you know, from, frankly, from our privilege, you know, we, we didn't get to choose it, it's, it's happening kind of to us most for most of us, but we've been uprooted from our privilege of knowing how to behave. Uh, and that was the benefit of the man box, right? The man box had very, has very clear rules. Uh, don't ask questions, don't be curious, uh, don't be weak, uh, always win. Uh, dominate uh, women and children, uh, the planet, LGBTQI folks, uh, put down folks who are different, especially if they have a different skin color, um, act strong, act sure, uh, never ask for help. Great. That's a, okay. There's a set of rules that I can build my life and my leadership around. Yeah. And it turns out that nobody wants that anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants leaders who behave that way. Nobody wants partners who behave that way. Nobody wants uh, parents who behave that way. And so we men continue to police ourselves and each other into that man box. But more and more people are saying, no, you got to get out of that. You got to open up. You got to be vulnerable. You got to tell me what's going on. You got to share power. Mm. You have to listen. You have to be vulnerable. And we're going like, wait, what? I thought that was North. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're forcing a lot of people to start drinking through a fire hose yeah. and that they have to understand it yesterday and that they have to have arrived to any awareness or understanding of these, right. These ideas or what is wanted going right. forward by, you know, what to see it's like a large majority of, of people on this, on this planet. Brandon's framing of the problem was excellent. And the thing that popped up for me about it is like, I have to drink from the fire hose. I have to understand all of this stuff yesterday. And Charles, knowing you as I do, like that's not where you come from. Like you have you have a deeply optimistic outlook about about how this is going and what's possible. And I'm going to use a frame from men's work that we've all heard a lot. Right. What's at risk? Yeah. Like what is it that we have to look at in ourselves in order to make this next leap? Right. Right. Yeah, I am. I am optimistic and empathetic, and and those characteristics of my approach to this problem. You know, can men lead? Should men lead? How can men lead? You know, come from all of my work with on Mankind Project weekends, on Boys to Men weekends, where I see men and young men step up. I know, I you know, there's no biological constraint that says men have to act like top-down power over you know bullying dogs that's a that's mm -hmm. a, a belief about men that i it is part of the man box and it is fundamentally anti-men so if you're hearing men or women say that's how men are that's how women are that ends up 
being fundamentally anti-freedom, anti-human, anti-man. I'm saying that we all have the capacity to be relational. We all have the capacity to be powerful. We all have the capacity to be assertive. And men have been at, uh, have been uh, skewed by this man box archetype or this man box paradigm about how to be masculine and how to lead so that we've forgotten all of our relational capacities, but we can relearn them. I've seen people relearn their relational capacities over and over. So what's at risk? What, what, if you, if you relearn those relational capacities, what's at risk? What happens to you if you admit that there's a part of you that needs to be relearned? Well, it is what comes up for a lot of men is a bunch of sadness and grief. Mm. Like, especially on those ManCon Project weekends or on some of the men that I coach around leadership skills, we have to stop. I've even talked to people who've read the book and who like, all this sadness came up for all of the wasted years. Mm. For the way that I treated employees, for the way that I treated my partners, for the way that I treated my kids, for the way that I treated myself. So it's, so grief may come up. Mm. And again, my optimistic assertion is that grief is okay. We can survive grief. Shine away from grief makes us weak. Mm. Shine away from grief prevents us from growing like tremendous trees, right? Shine away from grief keeps us, shine away from grief keeps us stunted. So if you're worried about what you're going to encounter as you examine your own life, as you examine your own uh, constraints or even culpability by being in the man box. I, you know, I bullied other kids. I was a, I was a victim of bullying and I bullied other kids. Yes, I, I did not always believe women. I didn't always treat women with full respect when it came to sexual relations. Uh, I didn't always lift up uh, younger people into positions of power when I was a supervisor. So I was culpable in some ways. I've policed other men into the man box. I've called other men, you know, weak or soft or whatever when they expressed emotions or when they expressed uh, doubt. Mm. So, I, you know, I've grieved that culpability. I've grieved what, what I did. I've grieved what was done to me. Uh, and I know that other men can grieve that as well. So that's one thing at risk is like, oh, I don't want to grieve. I don't want to be sad. Like, you can be sad. You're strong enough to be sad. Come on. You're going to be okay. Mm. Um, so that's at risk. And it is true that you're going to face some pushback from some of the people in your peer group. So some relationships may be stretched, may be pulled. You may so, lose some relationships. I want to slow us down, yeah. back us up, take a beat. The list, the litany of things that you took responsibility for as a man facing. So I, I want to just ask listeners out there, like any of those resonate for you? And do you notice anything in your body that comes up with it? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm a big fan of Resma Menachem. Menachem. I pronounce his name incorrectly every time. It's in your freaking body. The ways that you were bullied and the ways that you were bullied. The abuse that you've done to others, the abuse that you've taken, and all of that stuff gets wrapped in this cultural package called the man box in the West, right? Mm -hmm. And we as men now have a responsibility to step further into strength by processing all that stuff that got stuck in our bodies. Yeah, yeah but I don't want to do that, Boyson, because that gets in the way of productivity. That gets in the way of like just keeping the balls up in the air that I have. Everything's going to fall. Everything's going to burn. Everything's going to crash. The house of cards will fall if I have to look at that stuff. And I don't want to look at that stuff. I've been shoving that stuff down for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, Boyson. How can I even look at that stuff? Charles yeah. brings this beautifully into the frame in the book by talking about the simple fact that what was the percentage, the obscene percentage of workers who at the end of the day just feel destroyed every yeah. single work day. Yeah. The yeah. amount of energy it's taking us to reinforce and maintain all this structure, the amount of energy it takes me to hold back my emotions is more than the amount of energy it takes to actually process them once we start doing it. Yeah. Right. 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 We accept this daily, hourly 
exertion and exhaustion and fear. We accept that rather than taking a moment to say, you know what? Let all the balls drop. Let them all drop, Brandon. Mm -hmm. Let it all hit the fucking floor. Mm -hmm. Let it all come crashing down. And for most, for many men, for me included, it happened to me. Like in my early 40s, all the crap hit the floor. My relationship fell apart. I was, you know, terrible betrayal, terrible loss, terrible grief. The career that I thought was my sword and shield in the world, my purpose and my belonging as, a, as an educator, I could, was no longer able to reach the, the participants that I was reaching. My, my relationship with the outdoors was broken. I just cried every time I was outside. Mm. So it fell apart whether I wanted it to or not. Yeah. You expediated the inevitable when you do this work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for men who don't answer that call at some point, if it doesn't happen, you know, in a reasonably well-managed midlife crisis, which is what I had, it shows up as heart attack. It shows up as isolation from children and family. It shows up as losing your job. Uh, It shows up as getting arrested uh, it shows up as addiction, alcoholism. So sure, yeah, keep pedaling as fast as you can. Keep juggling as fast as you can to keep all of these misbegotten balls and chainsaws and bombs in the air or let all that drop and ask for help. And that's the that's the one thing I want to yeah. make sure that everybody Good. hears yeah. really clearly. I talk about in the book to get out of the man box and become the leader that you want to be able to lead well, live fully and leave a positive legacy, right? First step is to build this awareness, which anybody who's listening to this podcast is probably already part of, right? They're already beginning to develop some awareness about what could be different, what, what women's experiences are like, what it means to be in the man box, what it means to be out of the man box. But step two is ask for help. Don't try and do this on your own. There's no sense in that. Stepping out of the man box and asking for help is is like the most, the best way you can show that the man box has no more power over you, or at least reduce the power of the man box tremendously. Because one of the messages is that men need to be isolated, need to be lone wolves, need to go their own way, need to forge their own path. Mm -hmm. Don't ask Mm -hmm. for help. If you band with other supportive men, it means you're a beta. That's what the, that's what the man box says. But yeah. my experience over and over again is when I ask for help, I feel more powerful. I do feel humble in the moment, but then I feel so much more powerful and connected and safe and secure. Mm-hmm. Like I'm on the phone all the time talking to HVAC experts and HVAC consultants and electricians. And I just like, I don't know how to wire a house in this new hundred year old house of mine. I need help. I need help. I'm not going to try and go it my own way. Mm. Like, there's like a white and a black wire. Should I touch those together? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, I understand that fear, Brandon, that you, that you talked about is kind of the, the, the devil's advocate. You, we are told that we need to keep doing as men. We need to keep the money coming in. We need yeah, to yeah. keep, keep yeah. the, the performance happening. Yeah. Yeah. And that if we drop all that, we won't be men anymore. We will lose our masculinity if we stop. Yeah. We will lose our authority, our status, our privilege if we stop. And I'm telling you, you're going to gain connection. You're going to gain confidence. You're going to gain clarity. You're going to be able to grieve and let go a bunch of crap that's holding you back, that's weighing you down, that's keeping you stunted. You're not meant to be mm-hmm. stunted. You are not meant to be stunted. Mm-hmm. And not to mention, let's not ask people to change their values or what's currently important to them right now. You will make more money. You will ascend the ladder. You will experience more success in your career. There is overwhelming data to support and suggest that self-awareness and emotional intelligence is one of the key indicators of a successful, not only leader, but manager, employee, like wherever you land in your company. Parent, teacher parent teacher exactly so if those things are important to you then yeah it still leads to what it is that you want we're not saying that you have to shift your values to think of something else as more important if right now it's getting the car getting the girl i'm telling you you'll get the car and the girl taking the stuff on or the guy right so yeah yeah, look or the the dog you know you'll get a really good dog out of this (laughs) 
Oh, that's one dog. of the prizes. That's one of the prizes for stepping out of the man box. You get a really nice dog. No, I don't know. Yeah. Or, or a cat. Or, yeah. or a koi fish. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything yeah, yeah. that you want could be I, yours. I, yeah. So, you know, and then I'll throw, I'll spin it around and I'll come back as the devil's advocate here too. Like right. you are going to lose us some things too. Mm-hmm. Like you're yeah. going to lose the position of unquestioned authority that maybe you've been maintaining through this kind of domination game that you've been running, right? Yeah. This, this yeah. domination racket you've been running. So if that's what you're fully invested in, if you're fully invested in just having unquestioned authority over everyone around you, hey, stick to it. See, see how that works out for see you. how that works out <laughs> for you, right? Like, yeah. how's that working? There's, there's yeah. another phrase that we've heard, yeah. we've all heard in memory. How's that, how's that working with your teenage children? beautiful <laughs> can we talk about my teenage children no I, this is not that show but yes totally and and right. there it is it's right? not it's when not I... working out with employees either right that's one of the big changes in the 21st century you know we used to accept hierarchy right my my grandfather yes. my father to a certain extent hierarchy was expected in the workplace yes and it was reinforced by you know uh, uh compulsory military service all of that hierarchy was what people kind of understood to be how the world worked and it and it provided security and it provided kind of clarity but it constrained creativity it constrained progress and it kept people out of leadership and it kept people out of progress and and prosperity uh but the new the new generations coming up they're not interested in hierarchy Mm -hmm. i'm not interested in hierarchy anymore 21 year olds, 30 year olds, they're not interested in existing in hierarchical institutions where their ideas, their full humanity, their energy are boxed up. Yeah, that's not what they're interested in doing. And we know, again, we know that inclusive non hierarchical organizations meet their business goals, meet their organizational goals, Mm. you know, six to 11 times more. So hierarchy is not helping us anymore. No, and and hierarchy just to break it down even to further layman terms is this idea of uh, power over right right? that top down it's everything trickles down from the top whereas you know flattening that creates a more not a a big common concern right is a lot of people and i hear this from now i'm a millennial i'm not the the target's not on my back anymore it's fantastic (laughs) gen z that's the gen z they're gonna ruin everything um, yeah, yeah, whatever, boomer, whatever, yeah, outdated idea of how to run things. And, but, you know, so long as young, so long as it's communicated to young people getting into these fields of like the necessary resilient, like how necessary resilience is and putting the work, like you're not going to be an executive in seven months. I understand <laughs> right. that too. Like you've yeah, got to yeah, put yeah. a ton of work into this and, you know, and you got to, be willing to step into an arena where expect pushback, expect challenge, expect things to be tough just because we're going to flatten the hierarchy a bit. And perhaps there's more ability to communicate up and down or left and right, the chain of command, like it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to grow and expand. So for anyone listening that is afraid of how this idea of leadership may change going forward, it's not going to include the absence of, working you know working your ass off and and doing some really challenging stuff and and putting and it's going to be using using those relational skills that men in particular have been talked out of so those relational skill relational skills and also you talked about resilience resilience skills like patience uh, abiding in the unknown asking questions um uh letting your idea you know fall away your idea I, I, this is something terrible, really painful that I learned 10 years ago when I became uh, a full on executive leader, like ideas aren't really currency ideas. Everybody has ideas. Ideas are cheap. Mm-hmm. They're pennies. That's not, that's not where leadership has power. Ideas are not important. Um, what's important is the ability to create more power. Right. And when we, this is one of the, 
the conundrums or the, the beautiful uh, paradigm shifts of shifting from power over to power with is that in a power over paradigm, we believe that power is a pie. And when we divide it up, everybody mm -hmm, gets their little mm -hmm, slice mm -hmm. and I'm tr working to try and get my slice to be bigger. Yeah. But when we really invest into power with paradigm, we understand that the more people that have power, the more power there is. Yeah. It's not it's not a zero sum game. And that includes making sure that women, people of color, non-binary folks, LGBTQI folks, immigrants, whatever, that all of those people have as much access to power as possible. And that as leaders, if we can take a stand for other people's growth and success, we become more powerful. Yeah, it's that active sponsorship, right? If I am in a position of power or have some power in a company, and I witness someone of difference, it's not to say, hey, here's your green light just because you happen to not be white, straight and male. No, it's sponsoring that person to provide the necessary trials, the, nece the necessary exposure, the necessary experience to qualify for a position, to qualify for a role of responsibility. It it's just making sure that there's a tension there. And yeah, yeah. It it's, yeah. it's, it's and, not a redistribution of power. It's the, it's right. the, the sponsorship it's it's keeping it moving and flying right. and being willing to learn from that other person you know we we brought in mm -hmm. interns all the time into into my organization and um one of the interns we brought in fired up about preventing sexual violence and we were doing boys mentoring and so that felt like a little bit off to one side although obviously mentoring boys needs to include you know preventing sexual violence but he was just fired up about this particular aspect of it and he took the ball and ran with it and created I, he, you know every time he came up with a plan i'm like i don't think that's going to work in this community in my head i don't mm. think that's going to work i don't think that's going to work but he created a county-wide um conference statewide conference on preventing sexual violence he just created he just made it happen and i was doubting him the whole way mm. But I knew enough to let my to not let my doubts. I think they probably showed up on my face. I probably made that doubting face. But he was smart enough to ignore it a lot, um, and he just he just went and did it. And I learned a ton from him about just putting a stake in the ground and saying, "This is what we're going to do because this is really important, and we're not going to dance around what has been done before or what the community is ready for. We're just going to put it out there." If you're enjoying the Mankind Podcast. How about taking another step? This one takes some courage, and you have it. Check out the Men's Work Introduction. It's three sessions over three weeks. New sessions start every month, and we even have a cohort tailored to GBTQ men. Find out more in the show notes. Very nice. So, so there was a uh, voice in you got something. I just want to reflect back on the, you guys have kind of drawn the distinction, but I just want to draw the distinction even more clearly, like hierarchy, top down power over dominance based hierarchy. Like that's what we're pointing to. Mm -hmm. There's hierarchies of learning. There's hierarchies of skill. There's hierarchies of progress. There's hierarchies of creativity, like all of those things that are purpose driven, that are by agreement, that are with collaboration, like all of that good stuff that that helps that elevates that lifts us all but it's it's this unquestioned stuff it's ec yeah. extractive domination based hierarchy right that doesn't right. play anymore right mm -hmm. right and I th you know the mankind project is a really interesting example because there are on a on a warrior weekend i don't think i'm giving any secrets away but on a warrior weekend there are hierarchies for sure there are people who are leaders who are incredibly skilled and have done tremendous amounts of training and who have dedicated their lives to creating these experiences on these weekends. Yeah. And I, I show up as a just a, a, a worker bee, um, but I have all this leadership in me as well. I have all these ideas. I have these different ways that I would approach things, but the the ritual of enrolling the leaders and, and saying, okay, everybody, these are, the, these are the three or four. And it's also, it's not just one leader. It's a team of leaders. Yeah. These are your leaders for the weekend. Are you, are you ready to, to follow their lead? And I said, yes. And so later, as I'm working on the weekend, fulfilling a role that I would do differently if it were me. I'm like, no, I, I said I would follow that. I said, those guys are the kings. And this is, this is the role that they've given me. Mm. And for now, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it their way because I said yes to that. I was given an opportunity. So it's a, there's a democracy in that hierarchy, right? We essentially voted yeah. to say, yes, 
that's what I want to do. And I think, you know, there's a lot of work being done around holacracy or sociocracy and mm -hmm. uh, organizations that are run in really different ways. And I'm really new to learning about those different structures that are non-hierarchical. Um, but I come from the world of outdoor leadership in particular, where there's always at least two leaders. So it's not just one person. So the leadership is always shared. There's a very uh, a detailed structure around feedback and learning for the leaders, not for the participants. They get learning and feedback as well, but the leaders are always getting feedback. No one leader is ever alone, just running it and not getting any, any input from the folks that he's leading uh, or he or she is leading. Um, and it's, you know, it's full person. It's mind, body, spirit, leadership in the outdoors. And that's what I think, what I know can be brought into organizations. And if men are willing to open themselves up to that form of leadership, they're going to find themselves actually feeling stronger. And this is one of the points I want to make that I call the book, you know, Leadership and Masculinity, Embracing New Strength. Because my experience of rediscovering my relational capacities, rediscovering what it feels like to get feedback, what it feels like to ask for help, didn't make me feel less. It didn't make mm. me lose status. Mm. It didn't make me feel weak. It made me feel more powerful, more mm. capacity, more resilient. When I express vulnerability, I get relationship and support. When I express curiosity, I get really valuable information and so much more engagement from employees and, and people that I'm working with. When I share power, like I said, more power develops. Yeah. When I, when I look for win-win, everybody's happier. I'm happier. So mm -hmm. all of those ways that we were told to be strong in the man box, dominate power over win-lose exclusion and repression, all of those ways that we were told to be strong, turn out to be really brittle. And I think COVID in particular and the challenges that we're facing in the 21st century are showing us how brittle those expressions of strength are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when we can do win-win, when we can do power with, when we can be vulnerable and when we can be inclusive, those are not weak. Those are not a step down. Those are not like, uh, you know, second class leadership. Those are incredibly powerful. And that's really the, the purpose of my work. The purpose of my work and the purpose of this book is to kind of stand, you know, on the shore and say to men, hey, come on up here mm -hmm. out of the freezing water. Like, it's great up here. I'm look, I'm doing fine. Look at all these other men up here who've, who've stepped out of the water ahead of you. You're going to actually be better and happier. And the cool thing about this. Oh, beautiful. I, I, and what I want to kind of with draw from what you shared, Charles, is you can go on to a new warrior training weekend, weekend and a leader team is established and you don't happen to be a part of that leadership team. Despite all of your experience, your decades of experience leading other wilderness experiences, being in an executive at level as a leader, it does not mean you can't lead mm. in whatever mm -hmm. position or role you're in. So if you're listening, speaking to the listener now, if you're listening, thinking, well, I don't have the, you know, title EC, you know, in, in front of my name or, or anything that represents some form of leadership in a hierarchical structure it does not mean that you are not worthy as a leader, that you can't build your strengths as a leader. In fact, I recommend you start this now, wherever you are <laughs> in your, in your, uh, you know, in your career phase, yep. start it now because as you know, I've recently taken a um, started working at the university of Tennessee, Chattanooga, teaching emotional intelligence and leadership. And I just taught a class of tradespeople. Everyone started on the tool. They all came in work boots male they all started on the tools they then became foremen they then became managers like they're, they're somewhere in that track and they've had to learn to get out of my way i'll just do it because i know how they've had to learn quickly how to lead when before they were the craftsmen they were the artist they were the one that had the skill set and they're all saying to me i wish i started learning this stuff when i was on the tools mm. right 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 because right. it's a huge learning curve now not only the the logistical, the uh, administrative, the everything in, that goes into making sure that value is delivered to the person investing in that like concrete pouring, or if they're you know a chipping yeah. carpenter, 
but it's also all the relationships they're having to manage at the exact same time. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that, that men struggle with it again, comes out of the man box, right? So you're, master carpenter who's now in a leadership position of running a running a team he's going to have to deal with his own ego and perfectionism which comes out of the man box while he sees a couple of nails being driven incorrectly Mm. while he sees somebody learn how to put trusses together in a slightly different way than he learned or was taught Right. So this, so I want to kind of start talking about part three of the book or step three of of stepping out of the man box, which is to take concrete action. And one of the concrete actions is to actually meditate or do breath work or take walks in the woods, anything to reduce our male reactivity, our egoic reactivity to situations. So that when you as a leader see somebody driving a nail incorrectly, you can keep your mouth shut for a little bit and let that happen and let that learning happen. Now, obviously if it's an electrician and they're about to touch the grab, the black wire and the white wire at the same time, you gotta, you gotta be reactive, but you know, can you lower your activity? So when your kid says, right, I want to borrow the car or I hate you, or you never listen to me, or I'm going to date this uh, weird guy. Um, or I, I want you to go to the concert with me and, and have your hearing ruined, whatever it is um, that you can go, Hmm. Tell me more about why you want to do that. Same with employees. An employee comes to you with an idea. You've heard that idea a thousand times before. It never worked. Hmm. Tell me, tell me more about why you think that might work this time. So really, it's, it seems strange. It seems counterintuitive. What I'm recommending yeah. is one of the steps for taking action is to learn to be less reactive. Yeah, and, minding and the gap. Minding the gap. Right. Um, I'm a big fan of wilderness encounter. I think the outdoors has a tremendous amount to teach men in particular about the size and shape of our egos, Mm. right? Like when I'm, when I'm all in my crap, when my ego is overblown, it's like a red giant star, right? It's all like puffy and red and hot and it eats the planets around it. um, And it's doing nobody any good. But when I'm outdoors, I understand my relationship to the greater cosmos to the greater good to my community to other people around me and then my ego becomes like a white star still it's really bright it's really shiny it's i'm not diminishing i'm not covering it up but it's no longer taking up all this space and being hot and red and puffy and destructive Mm -hmm. so i'm mixing metaphors about being talking about being outdoors and talking about being in the night sky but um getting getting our ego into the right shape through art through wilderness encounter through meditation um, through journaling, all of those activities that can seem to men who've been told by the man box that you need to be active, sure that you don't you don't pursue self awareness because that's weak and soft somehow. But again, when you do those, I promise you, you're gonna feel uncomfortable. I promise you're gonna feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I promise that it's gonna take practice. It won't just it won't, it's not just taking a pill. It's like being in the gym. You got to keep doing it, but you don't have to do it a lot. I meditate once a week for 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. I should probably do it more if I want to should myself, but that is, that's enough for me. I, um, I journal I, every month or so. Yeah. And that's enough. I'm not prescribing this. Like you have to do this four hour work yeah. week kind of stuff to be a better leader and a better man. No one's saying, Hey, you need to start taking cold plunges tomorrow. I right. mean, I, I remember when I was working on a, a horse farm, I mean, you're working with animals there, there is an, it's an external force that you can't guarantee, like you cannot expect the mm. same thing day in, day out. And one of the, everyone on that farm smokes cigarettes, except myself. And one thing we learned to say in those moments where minding the gap, right? That the, the brain is being overloaded. It's about to explode. It's about to say something that you're later going to regret. It was go smoke a cigarette, <laughs> you know? We at the Mankind yep. Podcast do not condone or promote the uh, the use of <laughs> nicotine so products. Ah, but <laughs> Meta- metaphorical only. Go go smoke they, a metaphorical cigarette. Take, a, take a breath. Go for a walk. But, but yeah. it was the lo- it was the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah. yeah. Go yeah. go take go take a smoker before you do yep. something you're going to regret. Go take a breath. Right. It, it, you know whatever that practice can be. Listen to music. Like yeah. So, Whatever the lowest hanging fruit is um, in those moments to be able to, again, as so long as someone's life isn't in, in danger. Right. And the cool thing is, 
if you do react in a way that's unfavorable or in a way that you're thinking, man, I did that again. How did I, how could I be so stupid or whatever to, to react in that way when I know that that's not helpful? You then have an opportunity to repair it. Right. What would a strong man do in that situation? I've, I've yelled at somebody. I was reactive. I said something I regret. What would be the strong thing to do? Oh, to be yeah. stoic and never mention it again and just sweep right. it under the rug right. Mm -hmm. right? and just keep walking, keep going. Yeah. Or to take a moment and say, you know what? The way I spoke to you, I regret it. It's not in line with my values. I can tell it that it affected you in a way that I'm guessing wasn't pleasant. I'm guessing you feel you felt, you know, belittled or shamed. I don't want that for you and I'm going to do better. And one of the things I'm going to do is get back into my meditation practice because that's going to help me be less reactive and be more respectful of you. Yeah. Or ask for greater accountability around it. And, you know, yeah, that's yeah. brave. That's brave. That's strong. Yeah. So there's one of your domains of concrete action. I definitely want to touch on that. So that's a transformational domain. Let's yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. out the book, right? Yeah. Transformational domain. And apologies to all the astrophysicists listening for our misrepresentation of stars. And here's another different mechanical reference, right? Like, and this is the, I, f I fucked up mechanical reference. Yeah. If you start cross threading a bolt, what do you do? St stop and back it out. You don't crank it in further. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and so that's what we're saying is like, this makes sense. If you keep cranking it in further, doubling down on all this stuff, yeah, you're going to end up breaking your bolt. Mm -hmm. There may have been a penis metaphor in there somewhere as right. well. That's one of that, that place of, and I've been cross threading a lot of bolts, not the sexual way, but I've been cross threading a lot of bolts, this chair that I'm sitting in, I had to assemble right out of a box in my new house. And that place of, of having to stop and back up. And I'm just so impatient. I want this chair done and I have to calm myself down and back it up. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the places where I really have recognized in the last few months, like where the man box has really treated me badly. It's, it's not given me the skills to exist in the in-between places. Mm. I want to get done. I want to get this done. I want to have this conversation with my wife be finished. I want to get the, everything in, fixed in this house. I want to, you know, fix all the relationships with these elders that I'm taking care of. I want it done now. I don't want to have to keep practicing and backing up and making mistakes and feeling like a fool. Oh yeah. my gosh. Ugh, thinking, I... that, thinking that everybody is judging me. I've got all of this judgment on my head that's not there at all. Like, you know, I even, I made, I made uh, greens and chickpeas last night for dinner and I didn't like how they came out. And everybody who was eating is like, Charles, this is great. This is really good. Thank you so much for cooking for us. And all I could, you know, think about is how much better it could have been if I had the right ingredient or whatever. So all of that judgment is just piling on my head. And, you know, so what I'm doing right now is sharing that with you guys, that judgment that I keep feeling, that shame, that embarrassment. And now it's off my shoulders. It's offloaded. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the recommendations that I make in the book is to find a men's group, mm -hmm. find a group. This is really important for male leaders to find a men's group where you can be vulnerable, be open, share the things that are bothering you and share the joys. Men can be really bad at sharing joys, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just found out today that my house might actually be super insulated. Whee! Share that joy. Um, but uh, you know, when we, when we talk about those things, we reduce the impact that they have on us. So nice. find, find a group of men with whom you can be vulnerable. Well, uh, this is my moment to jump in and go toot toot honk yeah. honk. That's, yeah. uh, that's me tooting our horn here at the Mankind Project because we have some pretty, I mean, however you want to define success, but we have a pretty good network of people that have kicked serious butt in many domains, in many environments, mm. and many that would credit that to the time they've spent in our circles on our weekends. So that just work. little little honking of the horn here. And as someone right. who just assembled and unassembled and then assembled a cr again, a crib, <laughs> a baby crib, <laughs> And guess what? We're heading to Ikea on the weekend to get a dresser. So let's see how well that goes. 
but I had to oh, disassemble all of it. And, you know, uh, I get it. I get that desire just to drive it, just to drive it. You might, you might, you might need to meditate twice a week for 10 minutes. Oh, I think I need some ayahuasca is what I need. Yeah, there you go. That. There you go. <laughs> Do not Absolutely. assemble Ikea furniture under the influence of medicinal plants. Or dimethyltryptamine. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I want to take a, a quick risk here. Yeah. Charles and, and talk about compassion for many of our male leaders. Yeah that are in place that perhaps yeah. operate under the old mold. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, I, I love in, um, in Mark Green, you, you fellow co-host on the mm -hmm. making manhood podcast. I love, you know, his book, the little me too book for men. It really portrays the almost immediate shift in the psych collective psyche of us in the West around mm -hmm. males and leadership. And we just saw this huge uh, wave of scandal of uh, public demand for being uh, thrown out, whether mm -hmm. it was out of local government, whether it was out of you know companies. And perhaps this is not to abstain or to wipe clean anyone's actions, right? And the impacts of those actions. But perhaps some of these blokes, and again, I'm taking a risk in saying this, mm -hmm. but perhaps some of these blokes were just doing what the status quo has told them is okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and again, I have a ton of empathy for men who are operating out of the man box. And, but, but I don't, and, but I don't let that interfere with my empathy and compassion for the people who've been at the bottom of the heap of that, who've been the mm. targets of bullying, mm. who've been uh, just trying to get by, just trying to get to work safely, just trying to be at work safely, yeah. uh, trying to find ways to express their actual authentic humanness as a trans person, as a bi person, as a Trekkie, whatever it is, um, and and avoid bullying uh, in the workplace or or on the street, right? That's that's where all of our compassion and understanding should be pouring mm -hmm. is to the people who've been kept out of leadership, been kept out of prosperity, been kept out of safety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have compassion and empathy for men, and we have the position of relative privilege, relative yeah. privilege, right? Everybody struggles. Everybody has a hard time. I was bullied. You were bullied. I've had a hard time. I've been poor. I've been prosperous, yeah. right? I own relative privilege in this culture. It's, it's, it's handed to me. It's unearned privilege. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. everybody gets, everybody gets empathy. And one of the, the, uh, the steps I talk about in the book is just like for men, just start following women, LGBTQ, non-binary folks, follow them on Twitter, mm. follow them on Instagram. Don't engage with them. Don't argue with them. Just follow. Start mm. expanding your circle of understanding and compassion wider and wider. And this is actually, I didn't realize this, but that's something that Albert Einstein said. Albert Einstein talked about expanding the circle of compassion and that his work as an astrophysicist, again, you know, made him made his ego the right shape so that he started seeing how we were all interconnected. Yeah. So expand that circle of compassion. Yeah. Yeah. The more he learned, the less he knew that. And there's so you just place that beautifully into cognitive, which is another yeah. one of your domain of concrete action. Right. So yeah. following people outside of your normal sphere of learning, understanding, processing, all of that stuff is going to increase your cognitive ability to get out of the man box. You're going to understand more, which right. is going to give you more power in this position. So move to the last one structural. Yeah. So yeah. how do we do take concrete structural action? Right. So structural action is really important because no matter how much we build our awareness, uh, no matter how much we meditate, uh, we're still going to have implicit bias and we're still going to have kind of fallback default ways of being. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to take shame when I don't need to. I'm going to lash out when I shouldn't. Uh, I'm going to make assumptions about my neighbors of color that are just, just embedded in me. We, do, we know that implicit bias exists. If you, you're listening right now and you don't believe me, 
here's an opportunity to build more awareness and to work that cognitive domain. Go learn about cognitive bias. Take a cognitive bias training, an implicit bias training, I'm sorry. So if you are a leader, it behooves you to put structures in place that protect you and the people who you are leading from your mistakes and from your institutional mistakes, from those default assumptions. So, um, you know, a really simple structural change is to make sure that your HR policies uh, include DEI training, regular DEI training for yourself, for your employees. And I would suggest that leaders actually go and get DEI training outside of the sphere of work. Don't just do it at work, go outside and get it so that you can bring something new into work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, so that's kind of like a big structure. A little habit that leaders can do is to speak last. Speak last as a leader. Let everybody else talk, give them room. It doesn't mean you're not the leader. It doesn't mean you're smaller. It doesn't mean you have less power. It means that you are creating room and taking a stand for other people's growth development and ideas. And you'll sound a heck of a lot smarter. You will sound a heck of a lot smarter. <laughs> so a, a structural change could be big, changing yep. the structure of your organization, changing HR policy, changing da da da. A structural change could also be small. Like if you're the quote leader of your family, right? Yeah. Create an agreement in your family. A structural thing is an agreement, right? Right. I can right. be interrupted at any time to be called on my whatever have that agreement with my kids. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. a structural shift. That's going to help me see things that I'm not available to see when I am leading the, every conversation. Mm. Right. Else, right. 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 Yeah. So there's a, there's, that's a group habit, right? That's a group agreement of my, one of my favorite group habit is, is the check-in at, at the boys to men organization that I led you know, we did check-ins with the boys and then we started having check-ins in the leadership team. Mm -hmm. And then we started having check-ins at the board level. And then we started having our donors do check-ins when we met with our donors, because right. we just, that's the through line of that organization is emotional awareness, emotional fluency, emotional vulnerability. So we were just like, we're all going to do check-ins. We're all going to say, my name is Charles and I'm feeling excited or I'm feeling anxious or whatever it is. And I think leaders, I know that leaders can use those check-ins to start building whole personhood into an organization. Nice. Yes. Bring so that the, the humanity leader, back. bring the humanity back so that the leader is not out in the parking lot, taking deep breaths and leaving behind significant chunks of himself. And he's not implicitly asking his employees to leave behind significant chunks of themselves as well. Beautiful. Shout out to the check-in. I mean, I introduced the check-in to a marketing agency I was a part of, and it was amazing. There, something happened, and we were furious with the leader. Furious. And when we got a chance to check in, it was amazing how many of us just put down our weapons because we were like, dude, what a gauntlet this guy's going through in both at home, in, in, in the workspace. And it gave all of us a bit of perspective to not identify how that decision was made. Right. And then how we could support, right. Let's not put anything on his desk today or for, or for the week or until we get a different check. in. Right. right. right? Let, let's right. kind of lift as human beings and kind of go above the line here, regardless of someone's behavior being below the line or perceived as to be below the line. Let's, let's be humans. Let's be humans that's, and be compassionate. That's a great story. That's a great story about a leader taking an opportunity to be to be vulnerable and what happens, right? Mm -hmm. The man box tells us if you're vulnerable as a leader, you're going to get pulled down. The dogs, the rest of the dogs in the pack are just going to tear you to pieces. Mm -hmm. But what happens in the 21st century is that if you're if you're vulnerable in a in a relatively safe, doesn't have to be a perfectly safe, but a relatively safe organization, you're going to receive support. Mm -hmm. You're going to receive empathy. And that was my experience. I, I was trying to be, when I got promoted to executive director, I tell the story in the book, I forgot everything I knew about proper strength-based and new strength leadership. And I started trying to do top-down stuff. I isolated myself. I was belittling my employees and I lost their support. Yeah. But when I went and got transformational coaching, started meditating again, blah, 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 and went to my team and said, I'm so sorry. I've been treating you badly. I've been leading outside of my values. I feel terrible. I need your help. 
in leading better. Will you help me? Yeah. Boom. So much support uh, and not a loss in productivity, but a tremendous flowering of productivity Mm. in the organization. And I started sleeping and eating better because I was getting support. Yeah. There you go. The knock-on effect. It just, whether it's in the boardroom or the bedroom, the knock-on effect is universal. Right, right, right. So, I mean, I hope that, again, I hope that men who are listening are feeling intrigued, maybe a little scared, Mm -hmm. maybe a little doubtful. I don't know, Charles, that sounds like a bunch of Pollyanna hooey. Um, You know, go ahead. There's a, a, we'll put a link out uh, that will allow you to download a free chapter of my book. Check that out. It talks about what kinds of challenges men are facing in 21st century leadership, what the world is calling for. See if that resonates with you. Um, reach out to me with more questions and uh, check and be, you know, the books, I don't know, eight bucks on, on Kindle and, and check it out. Uh, I try and provide a really uh, approachable, easy way out of the man box. And, and there's exercises throughout the book. So you can, you reflection exercises, opportunities to write stuff down, opportunities to, to reflect, opportunities to challenge yourself, a list of different structural changes to make in an organization that you can choose from, like a, like a Chinese menu. Um, and you'll, if you follow along in the book, you'll end up with your own personalized action plan. Nobody's going to be telling you what to do. You're going to have your own plan. Yeah. on how to improve your leadership so that you can, again, you know, live better, lead better, live fully and, and leave a positive legacy. The book is leadership and masculinity, embracing new strength. Yeah. By available. Charles Matthews. Mm-hmm. And it's only six bucks on Kindle. Yeah. Great. And it's 184 pages. This is an incredibly digestible book you can get through this book. So if you, if you want two core books that have come out of this episode, Charles's book and go get Mark Green's book at the same time, the little me Too book for men, those Absolutely. are going to be two core tomes that you can have on your leadership shelf. Yeah. This has been great, Charles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I love talking to you guys. You guys are so, so smart and open and, and uh, I feel, I feel better having spoken. And that's, that's again, Get a find a men's group, find a find a group of men that you can that you can speak to in this way about important topics. Yeah. And if there's one final thing I can add to this book, it's the perfect balance of theoretical, practical, tangible. Like it's not a it's not requiring you to fill in the spaces at every step. It's also not telling you all the stuff that is without the actual practical application. It's such a beautiful marriage of both, which in essence is masculine. Yeah, so I do appreciate okay. the, the applicability, although some, you know, depending on where you're currently at in your journey as a leader or as a man and how your inner compass relates to what you're hearing out there in the world, just know that this book will, it'll challenge you, it'll stretch you, but it'll also highlight and uh, kind of expose the yellow brick road, you could say. Right, right, right. Yeah, your hero's journey. Yeah, thanks for that, Brandon. Yeah, beautiful. Well, guys, this has been another recording of the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove there is more than one way to be a man. Special thanks, boys, and for you joining us today. And uh, to you, Charles, any final little, uh, yeah, anything final that you'd like to leave with the listeners before we sign off? No, uh, go to charlesmatthews.com slash mankind. Uh, by the time you hear this, the the uh, the special page will be up with a, an opportunity to, to download a free chapter of the book, charlesmatthews.com slash mankind. And it's C-H-A-R-L-E-S-M-A-N-K-I-N. Wait, Charles Matthews, C-H-A-R-L-E-S-M-A-T-H-E-U-S.com. Uh, M-A-T-H-E-U-S, <laughs> Matthews. I yes. have been absolved from getting your... <laughs> pronunciation of your name wrong at the beginning of this episode yes <laughs> brilliant this is what happens when you do a cross-country move i don't know which direction is north i don't know how to spell my own name <laughs> hey there's your last call to action everybody is listening to the podcast right now point to the north and if you don't know where that is go figure it out <laughs> <laughs> links to everything you've heard in this episode will be in the show notes lots of love we'll see you next week This has been another episode of the Mankind Podcast, produced in association with the Mankind Project USA. 
We have been your hosts, Paul Newell, Boyson Hodgson, and myself, Brandon Clift, and we want to thank our guests for joining us today and imparting their wisdom from their experiences in this amazing journey called life. If you want to find out more about today's guests and support them in their mission, you can find links to them in the show notes. Now, if you have found gold and insights that you believe could benefit your loved ones and those you care about, be sure to share it with them. And of course, we are always grateful for a rating and review of the show on iTunes. Now, we've got to give special thanks to our back-end team, producer, editor, and audio ninja for the show, Michael J. Russa, and Don Huff, who takes care of our graphics and promotions and pretty much makes us look pretty. So, of course, thank you, Don. Now, above all else, we've got to thank you, the listener. Because through your attention and your support, you have made it possible for us to let men all over the world know that they are not alone and that there is more than one way to be a man. And if something in this episode has touched you, then perhaps it is the call to action to get involved in men's work. With live trainings happening constantly and in-person trainings happening all over the world, the Mankind Project definitely has something for you. Now, if you've enjoyed the music in this episode and all of our episodes, be sure to check out Jim Donovan and the Sun King Warriors. I have links to them in the show notes. And lastly, just know what it means to me to be a man is completely different than what it means for you. What it means for Paul, what it means for Boyce, and that is the beauty of this journey. So if you are looking for guidance, support, and community as you begin to unpack and dive deeper into your men's work journey, then you know where to find us. Same place, same time, next week. Lots of love. We'll see you then.